We've talked on this channel about what the state of Arizona is doing to solve our water shortage issues, but we haven't talked about what local Tucsonans are doing to take charge of their water. Today we're talking about how average Tucson citizens can and are taking charge of creating a sustainable water future. Hey everyone, it's Kimberly, your go-to real estate agent here in Tucson, Arizona, and today we are talking about how local Tucsonans are taking charge of their water future. The guiding light in this mission is the Watershed Management Group. We went to attend their 11th annual home tour and started off at their living lab headquarters in Midtown Tucson. We actually spent most of the time here. We weren't able to tour many homes, unfortunately, but I promise we will have a more detailed home tour demonstration in the new year. The reason we spent so much time at the lab was because we were lucky enough to have a very informative tour guide that shared watershed management group's mission and really helped us understand the best methods that individuals can implement in order to create the most impact locally when it comes to water. When you're ready to buy or sell a Tucson home, I'd love to help you out. All my contact information is in the description below each video on this channel. And there are over a hundred other Tucson videos on the channel, including Tucson water information and Tucson natural disaster information so subscribe for more of that content. And now, without further delay, here is Watershed Management Group's Living Lab Program Coordinator, Jonah Ivey. So let me, let me tell you a little bit about what we do at WMG and where we are, because I think that those two things are really important to everything else. So the first thing is that we're on Tohono O'odham land, and that's really important with all the work that we do because everything we're working towards is finding that balance that that community had for so long. And uh, a lot of the answers are not technical skills that we have to learn how to do. They're in the relationships we have with the land and water that we are on and that we use. And so when we can look to these indigenous communities and not just the Otham, but even the Pasquayaki who came in the 1930s and migrated here, but came with that relationship with the land. So if we can learn from these indigenous communities that have that relationship, all the skills that we have going forward, all the technical know-how solutions, they, they have much more uh, real impact. It's really important to recognize and ground ourselves in that. That's what I always start every, anything I do with every day in my life as that relationship to the land and uh, that's the best that's the most important way you can honor these communities is finding that relationship that love and so wmg here we're all focused on relationships for that reason it's in our mission statement we're focused on building relationships between our people community and the environment and helping us realize how one we are everything that we do from there disseminates from that focal point Water is really a, a great medium towards building that relationship, and it's an important foundational first step to building that relationship, which is why it works so well. We do things differently. We teach a native edibles class. I co-teach that. So these things are, how do these relate to water? You know, we talk about beavers and habitat restoration. How does this relate to water? Right, so we don't just focus on water. So anyway, here we are, Watershed Management Group. What does it mean to have a relationship with the land and water? We run basically 100% on rainwater. So that's a start, that's a statement. There's months sometimes where we don't, uh, where we can't run on rainwater for various reasons. Maybe there's a crack in our tank and we lose water. Or maybe we use a bunch of water for a program. <laughs> that happened last year and we ran out of <laughs> water. You know, but for the most part, we have enough rainwater to be able to survive on it here at this spot. We're all about rainwater. We definitely don't like using CAP. All of us here use this term hydro local, which basically means using just the water that's within our micro watershed. So the rainfall that we have and the groundwater underneath us, we want the majority of it to be rainwater. And groundwater is like only in the years that we don't get rain. We don't even want to tap into it at all during a rainy year. Uh, we used to go to people's houses and give designs. We still do designs but we don't do any installation afterward. And so those designs are more for DIYers. We get into this habit as a community to look toward organizations and entities and agencies to be the keyhole to our solutions. 
right? But really, when we look how big the issues are that we have to face, we realize that no agency or collective of agencies can have the capacity to address these issues. And so we get in this habit of, can you do this for me? Can you come out and do this and like support this project? And it's it's all in pure intention. We want to see a better world, but that better world's only going to come when we take that step into the unknown and try something new and we become the solution. And that's why I'm always emphasizing like gray water could be buckets. Your basin doesn't have to be a huge swale. It can be a little depression. These solutions, these lifestyle changes, don't have to be like these expert designs that are full scale systems that you create. They're these little teeny steps you take every week, every day, every time you're with a friend. And then slowly this happens, truly. This is what happens slowly. Here's a fun fact. If we had flush toilets on this property, we would not be able to store enough water on this property to flush our toilets. It's because of this that we're able to survive on rainwater, you know, almost just rainwater. It's like, I, the one in my house smells like soil and it smells really good. And I put like sage and pine needles in it. This is pretty fun. And so even, but even if it did smell bad, like, is that really a big cost to going from not having enough space to flush your toilets to being able to survive on rainwater? So it's these little steps that we can take. There's three things that I like to say. We're reducing our water use by not flushing our toilets. We're building healthy soils with the compost that we're making, which increases the amount of water that this, the soil can store. Right, so we're increasing the capacity of water storage in our soils. And then our urine is also a fertilizer with potassium, nitrogen, and phosphorus, and the water source, right? So we have a irrigator over there by our citrus trees because those are our highest water users. So if you just have to pee, go pee by the high water users because it's actually a substantial water source. And in a community space like this, where like people are peeing 10, 15 times a day, you know, 20 times a day, that is what's giving us fruit throughout the year. So it's, it's crazy. We, we think we live in scarcity but actually we live in total abundance. We have two types of systems, like 55 gallon drum barrel system. And that one, there's a lot of options. Like we just shovel it out. Another way you could do it is you could have the barrel like above ground and have a step up. So then you could just put it on a dolly and then dump it to wherever you're going. But these ones, we have little doors on the backside and we can just open those up and shovel it out that way. And we just put it everywhere because it's like sometimes people, again, like always get so focused on taking care of the plants. So they'll apply their fertilizers to where the plants are. But the roots of those plants are dependent on the microbial system. If this part of the microbial system's dead because you're not focused on it at all, then that one's super damaged. So the tree is not benefiting from you neglecting <laughs> this aspect. So we'll put it everywhere and focus on soil health in every inch that we can. Compost, poop, yeah. love poop. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a bunch of days where these racks are totally filled up with bites. I love it. It's really cool. Again, about the relationship with the land and water, not uh, just the water. And biking, it, it makes that relationship stronger because it slows down your day and you're forced to be around the landscapes in your city and be observing them. And it also is really good for the environment because you're reducing carbon emissions, et cetera, et cetera. 40 to 60% of our cities are dedicated to car infrastructure, depending on which city you're in, sometimes even more. So like LA, like even more. And so actually the car infrastructure is maybe the biggest detriment to our urban ability to recharge water. Because 40 to 60% of our landscapes for cars are impervious. And so surprisingly, having a, a bike rack through here is maybe one of the biggest ways that we're addressing our watershed issues. We're trying our best as an org to opt out of the car infrastructure that's making it really hard to harvest water and infiltrate water. On the other side of you, another cool thing, a food forest. Yes, it's wonderful. You may see little black tubes popping out and things like that. And that is um, all gray water coming from our sink, our AC condensate, our laundry water from our laundry machine. Our shower used to drain in here and we're moving it, so it's going to drain in here. We have the irrigator, the pee from the urine. 
going into this landscape. So these, all this food that's growing through here is supplied by the water's second life, basically, in this landscape. So we really are using very minimal supplemental irrigation that's like just for the purpose of watering plants. Most of it's rain that's falling on it. It's street runoff that's coming from the street through these depressed landscapes, these lower landscapes, and it's gray water. And we eat from these trees all year, and so do the birds, and all of us are singing in the morning and having a good time. So this food, this abundance of food that grows from the water that we have available, it's changing our, our lives because it, it makes it more enjoyable. It gives us food security. It brings more habitat and wildlife and beauty into our landscapes. We also have our chickens in here. So anything, when we eat our pomegranates off our pomegranate bush, tree, then we throw all our scraps into the chicken coop and then they eat the rest. And then they poop and create compost. So our compost is in the chicken coop and they like roost over it and poop into it and eat all, all of our food scraps and then we eat their eggs. And we all cook a staff lunch for staff lunch every month. We cook it together and we eat, we usually have our eggs and a bunch of the foods from our living lab in those, in those lunches. What are the connection points to, uh, to the watershed and our livelihood. The connection point right here is that it's our food system. It's our transportation. You know, the watershed, it, it's almost dictated entirely by it. The street runoff that's feeding this food system is also reducing flash floods and stormwater downstream because now instead of it continuing down the road, it's infiltrating into our food forest. So we're also disaster resilient and disaster relief, stopping flash floods and making our soils wet for drought years. So it's like all these connections. And that's, again, what we're all about here at WMG. We're not just about harvesting rainwater, we're about building connections with our environment. So this is a tippy tap. If you were to leave your sink faucet on in your bathroom for a minute, or 30, second, 30 seconds to a minute, you'd use somewhere around half a gallon to a gallon of water per, per washing your hands. So washing my hands with this can wash up the 30 hands with one gallon of water. It's like 3000% efficiency, you know, compared to our sink. And all that water is going into the landscape. And you could literally build this out of trash from your wash. And the one at my house is built out of things I collected in my wash near me or my river. This is again, like compost toilets, low maintenance, low cost gray water. These are the things that are gonna allow us to live here, have a relationship with this land. Then using it as drinking water and stuff like that, that is uh, like the next step we could take as a bigger community. A uh, cool little fact from USDA, a 1% increase in organic matter on an acre allows that acre of soil to hold 20,000 more gallons of water per year. But don't think about the numbers. Think about the concept. The healthier our soil is, the more organic matter in it, the more life in it, the more water it can hold. So. I'm going to give an example of putting a rain tank in your house, how it could be bad. You put this big rain tank in your house because you want to water your trees or whatever. And now you're capturing all the water off your roof that's no longer going to the landscape. Right? And you're keeping it in this tank. So you're dehydrating your landscape in order to store the water in your tank for later use that you can give to the tree. But because the, your soil health has not been established and now you're stopping more water from getting to it, even the water you have in your tank is less effective at watering the tree because the soil that the tree is in can't hold the water very well. So that's why we focus on soil first. Before we built a 10,000 gallon rain tank right there or put these in, we did the landscape and made sure that the so it was set up to build healthy soil. It doesn't happen just from creating a depression in the landscape for water to settle. When we talk about rainwater harvesting here, we're talking about three things together. We're talking about capturing the rainwater in some kind of space, putting a food source for the soil into it, the mulch, and then creating infrastructure for that water to infiltrate into the ground and build healthier soils. So not just your tree with the basin, but trees and grasses and shrubs and wildflowers and vines and everything else in between, tubers, all of these things are infrastructure for the soil. That's what we're doing when we're rainwater harvesting. 
is we're creating a really healthy ecosystem to build soils and those soils will do the rainwater harvesting for us. They'll store the water in the ground and keep it there accessible to the plants in years to come. They'll recharge our ground aquifers and eventually create flowing rivers. The water you harvest into a rain tank is only as effective as the soils that you're giving that water to. This is what I like to tell people that our capacity for destruction reflects our capacity for creation. And just how we had no idea how crazy we were screwing things up for ourselves, I think that if we opt into a relationship with the soil and water and environment, and we opt into a nurturing role into these ecosystems, we have no idea how fast it's gonna repair itself. There's so many things that are working together in these complex relationships and communities that if we just let it do its thing, and we just play, we just, we're just there to support. I bet you we'd be surprised how quickly we can rebuild. That's why first it doesn't start with the technical how-to, how do we do this? It starts with what's your relationship to the land and soil? We capture all the storm water from Discount Tire. People will sometimes ask me, aren't you concerned about the chemicals and the waste from these, these car mechanic shops? And I say, no, most of these chemicals are petrochemicals, meaning they're carbon-based and carbon is a food source in these highly resilient landscapes. We're, we're diluting it every time it rains, it gets diluted and then we filter it through the soil. That is our way of bioremediation and wastewater management. Now I'm gonna talk about rain tanks. This underground rain tank, even though it captures 10,000 gallons of water, it overflows multiple times every year. We have so much water available, like all this water that's going into the landscape and we're not even getting the roof water because it's all going into the tank. And even so, it's still overflowing into the landscape. We have so much water, it's crazy, y'all. We just don't know how to use it. Everything we need, we have here. The barrier is not technical solutions. It's, it's that we use too much water and don't capture any of the water we have. There's a few different types of rain tank systems. This underground cistern is like super complicated and it has a carbon filter and a UV filter that it goes through to make it publicly safe to drink. And then it's connected to a pump. So it's on all of our tap. So any spigot, any hose, any sink, anything on the whole property is on rainwater. So that's what you're getting when you open it and from our rain tank. So that's a pump system. It's all complicated and crazy and it costs a ton of money. And it's really like only a good thing, I think, in my opinion, for community spaces. But for the house, you really don't need that much water. You can get away with something like 2,000 gallons or 3,000 gallons. This is called a dry inflow tank. The reason for that is it's this super, super simple system where the water flows from a gutter into a tank. And this is the overflow. So every single system you're going to have is going to get more water than it can handle because that's just how water is abundant and it will overflow and it overflows into this basin series the reason it's called a dry inflow is because the water goes through this pipe and into here and it's like all above ground and it, if you were to stick your hand in there it would be dry because it's it's the, at a high point on the tank and no water is settled in it so you'd only want to do this if you wanted to put your tank right next to your house and it's the simplest tank type of system you could do. It uses the least amount of pipe, et cetera, et cetera. But let's say you wanted to have your tank kind of in the middle of the entrance over there for some reason. And the only water source to fill it up was from the welcome center over there, which is the case for that tank. You can't have a dry inflow system because the pipe would have to be in the air going above head like 30 feet. And then it would probably break over time. So a wet inflow system is when the the pipe or like the water goes from the roof into the ground and then goes underground to your collection system and then it goes up into it. And the reason it's called a wet inflow is because the water is always resting inside the pipes. If you're like a practitioner, these things are important, but just as people learning, scratching the surface of water, it's all about building the soil health and then also reducing our water use. Everything we do after that has such a larger impact if we learn first those two things. And maybe even before rain tanks and all that, I'd say learn how to harvest the native edibles growing all over your city because you don't need to maintain your landscape very much if there's food growing everywhere already. Why, why plant fruit trees and get a rain tank if the mesquites, palaveras, and ironwoods are all edible and you could be eating those fruit trees, you know, not using that water for that. There's a lot of important first steps that are simple before getting to these like hydro local states where we're just relying on rainwater. We live in a blessed land. So many things can grow here. 
Let me give you a metaphor. When we're water harvesting, when we're doing permaculture, I like to say we're building cities. And in a city, you need infrastructure, you need food, and you need water. And from there, usually the city, the population can figure everything else out. So when we're water harvesting and we're building healthy soils, the basins, that is the water system. The plants are not the society, they're the infrastructure to the city we're building. They're the building. They're the schools and the hospitals and the housing units. We want a really diverse amount of infrastructure. You need to have multiple types of trees, but you also need grasses and trees and shrubs, these different types of root systems. So that's the infrastructure to the city we're building. All the mulch and decomposing matter, like what I'm standing on, that's the food system to our city. That's how they grow and populate and fungus, bacteria, and other microorganisms. And so everything we're doing is about the society down there. We are trying to set up a city and an infrastructure that helps that society thrive. What are we in relation to the city? I'd say that we're infrastructure. The plants are infrastructure. I'd say we're infrastructure. The birds and the bees and the butterflies and the frogs, infrastructure. The soil is like this society. And if they are supported and set up the right way, they'll maintain their buildings. But you put the wrong buildings into a community or you put poor infrastructure in place and it's just gonna need more and more maintenance and more outside mutual aid. Whereas you set it up the right way, that community is gonna thrive and they're actually gonna enhance all the infrastructure. So that's the society and we're the infrastructure. And what we see is that if we set this society up poorly, the soil health, then they're not gonna be able to maintain us with food that has lots of nutrients, clean water and healthy watershed cycles, clean air, that is our bioremediation for our air, the minerals for the materials we use, like for these, for like concrete even, like everything is based from the soil first. When I said like all we're doing is growing fungi and bacteria, it's cause for us, the plants are like very secondary. It's all about creating healthy soils and they will maintain the plants better than we can. And they'll maintain us better than we can. Us as like infrastructure for the society, we have a really magical and divine role. You could hire us or just attend our educational programs and let us be like that kind of inspiration and empowerment. You don't need to pay us. Just come to the free things we have. Power yourself. Maybe we could bring a program to your space. So one program we run, we teach residents in a neighborhood how to teach about rain gardens and then they like so then like three neighbors will say neighborhood leaders will co-teach a class at one of their houses and bring all their neighbors to it and it's always a potluck because it's like a party you know like, i don't do things if there's not food and that's just a ground rule so you know i don't do it if there's no food so it's this potluck right and the residents are teaching it and i'm there as a resident expert at the end of the class and we're all partying and stuff and everyone gets free byob kits which is a native tree, a shrub, two grasses, wildflower seeds, mulch, and the how-to zine guide. And because they're all neighbors, and the, the, their neighbors are the ones teaching the class, they do all the work together in their, each other's yards. So everyone builds these basins together. That's why we don't do projects for people anymore. We want to help with the community projects rather than host them. And you could take that training to be a neighborhood leader, so you now have the skills to do it and the confidence to organize. The largest amount of water is being used in ag agriculture, but who's consuming the agriculture? Where's the largest population? If we look to the root of the problem, it's not agriculture that's a problem, it's our culture that's a problem. Where's the culture change gonna happen? Where the people are. So that's why we're really focused on teaching people, again, not about rainwater harvesting, but about relationships with our ecosystems. If we can change our culture here, the agriculture industry will change too. For example, I teach native edible classes. If we're all eating native edibles, and then we convert all of our agriculture industry in these rural economies to permaculture systems that are using stacked functions, and all manual labor of hand picking, that would actually not only reduce the amount of water use that we're using to almost zero, but it would recharge the rainwater that's falling onto those landscapes. And we'd be creating natural recharge zones rather than sectioning out water management with agriculture industry. Like those two are intersects.
Uh, in order to create a sponge within the soil, you need to have plants. And the sponge is what holds it. So it's a really complicated, groundwater recharge is a really complicated subject that goes really deep. <laughs> Kind of take what I'm saying with a little bit of a grain of salt. In general, the food industry is the greatest user, but it's our culture that's the user of the food industry. So that's where the change will have to start. I hope you've learned a little bit about where to get started on your water saving journey, as well as what we can do as individuals to impact our local community for sustainability. We will have a link to the watershed management group below so you can explore the classes, materials, and events. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe button to follow along with Tucson News and learn more about things to do and see and know about this city, my hometown. And when you're ready to buy or sell a Tucson home, you know how to find me, all my contact information is in the description below each video on the channel and please check out other videos on the channel after this one. I appreciate you hanging out with me today and I will see you in the next Tucson video.